In this video, we're going to convert a 4 mil scale model of the Bedford TK made by EFE to full radio control. And this is the finished model. Now, the uh, original model is this, fresh out the box, um, a bit of a garish orange colour. It's assembled using rivets, and the first job, of course, is to drill all the rivets out, or as many as we need, in order to disassemble it, uh, starting with the load bed body. We next need to record the track of the wheels uh, to make sure we put them back at the right spacing. Now, the actual model itself, the orange one, uh, wasn't correct. They were spaced too wide. So I'm referring back to a model I did uh, on a previous occasion, which was correct. But measure it and write it down. Now, after that, carefully remove all the wheels. Uh, and then we need to look at the front wheels and... Uh, remove the front tyres, and then we need to fill the recesses in the back of the tyres with milliput. And once that is hard, uh, we will be boring them out in order to take the little flanged ball races uh, so we can assemble the steering axles. Now I, I do this with a cocktail stick uh, it's not a difficult job, uh, but it is an important one, uh, and this is how it looks when we've done. Once it's dried like this, I then put it in a lathe and I face the back off flush. If you don't have a lathe, don't worry about this, uh, you can do it with a large-ish file and just make sure the back is completely flat and true. It will then be ready for boring out four millimeters diameter. Again, I do this in a lathe. Uh, don't worry if you don't have one. Uh, it is perfectly possible to do this without a lathe, doing it by hand. And I'll come back to that and I'll show you in a few minutes. Uh, but in a lathe, uh, this is how I do it. I just introduce a four mil drill very carefully I need to make sure that we don't break through the front of the wheel. So I measure the thickness of the wheel and measure how deeply I'm going. And I go about two and a half millimetres deep to make sure that we don't burst through. In this particular instance, I also ran uh, an end mill just to bottom it out. But it's the first time I've ever done that. Uh, a comparatively easy job, but one that needs to be done with care. These are the bearings I use. They're flanged bearings, and they are 1.5 millimeter internal diameter, with an OD, an outside diameter, of 4 millimeters. And I buy them from eBay. Lots of suppliers on eBay. Now, doing the job by hand, this is actually one of the back wheels. Uh, I make sure the tyres are on nice and true all the way round uh, because it's important that the hole ends up true and concentric. So the tyres have to be uh, nicely fitted. Uh, and then with a drill in a pin vise or a chuck, uh, holding it as vertically as possible, we twist the drill the normal clockwise direction but very importantly, we rotate the wheel anti-clockwise. And this will help true up the hole as it goes down. Uh, and now if we insert a bit of 2 mil axle material, uh, we will see that the hole has ended up surprisingly true and concentric when we rotate it. Uh, I've done this on a number of other occasions and got surprisingly good results.
So uh, although it's not foolproof, it does work really well. Um, I'm going to hide the battery in the load bed of this vehicle uh, under the actual bed and between the frames, which aren't quite wide enough. So I'll have to cut out the floor and then file back the inside of the frames to make room. A piercing saw is by far the best tool for this job. We drill a hole to, to start, uh, thread the blade of the saw through, and then off we go cutting out the rectangle internally. We then need to clean it up with a file and thin the frames to fit the battery. I use a block in the vise to be able to grip the load bed without damaging it. We then have a look at the chassis, which also needs a large slot cut out to accommodate the gear motor, the gear and the charging point. This is also easiest and best done with the piercing saw. There will be more cutting to be done to the chassis later on, but at this stage, it is only this hole that we do. And there we have it, a nice load of meat chopped out of this chassis. The, the uh, steering axle is the next bit that we're going to look at. And, uh, no, I beg your pardon, we're going to reinforce this. That's right. Um, the chassis needs reinforcing at the front. Uh, this is very important because uh, later on we're going to cut uh, the slot for the steering axle and if we don't do this the front of the chassis will fall off. We're using 1.5mm brass in this instance uh, with another piece 5mm thick or 5mm wide soldered to the front. Uh, and this will bridge over the top of the axle. The reinforcing piece is epoxied to the uh, chassis using a good quality epoxy. I use Devcon. Uh, I find it very strong, very stable. Don't use a cheap epoxy. It'll fall off. It won't do the job. Uh, once uh, it is epoxied on, leave it to cure properly for 24 hours before doing any further work on the chassis. Here it is in place. Uh, as much surface area contact as we can, and it bridges over the axle, as I mentioned. And now uh, we put fillets of epoxy uh, wherever we sensibly can in order to get the maximum uh, contact between the original chassis metal and this structural reinforcing plate. There we go. Now, this is 24 hours later, it's cured, and in front of the reinforcing plate there is a new hole which I used a piercing saw to cut out to accommodate the steering servo, this 1.7 gram steering servo I bought from Deltang, which fits very neatly and cosily into this hole. As you can see, this will also be epoxied into place, which not only will hold the servo in its correct place, but uh, this will also help reinforce the chassis that uh, we have continually been weakening by cutting bits away. The bottom of the servo uh, will end up flush with the underside of the chassis and when we fit it, uh, we want it to be 
true flat and level with the chassis, the metal of the underside of the chassis, but we will also place it so it is slightly leaning back. And the idea behind that is just so uh, we make sure it clears the windscreen of the cab when the cab is refitted. It would be a, re a real pain uh, to have problems uh, when we came to put the cab back. So uh, let's say a five degree lean back to the servo is all we need. Uh, we also put fillets of epoxy uh, around the servo again, again to help reinforce the joints. And there we have it, the servo happily fitted. Now, using a brooch, reamer or drill, we open out the rear axle holes in the chassis to two millimetres uh, for the new axle to make sure it rotates freely, but without undue slop. We don't want it rattling around in there. Like so. Now, here we have the gear motor we'll be using and the bevel gears. Um, I've already opened out a pile of these and we need to open out one of them to 1.5 mil to suit the bevel gear and we need to open out another to 2 mil for the new axle. I epoxy the 1.5 mil one to the motor very carefully and I use Loctite to secure uh, the other one to the axle when I'm happy with the wheel positions. I also remove the boss on the 2 mil one to get the bevel gear to its ideal position. Now the steering axle is a laser cut kit I make, but you can scratch build these as well. Now supplied are two beams, an arrow-shaped spacer, which you can see there, uh, stub axles, that's a double stub axle there, and two single stub axles, and two side plates. Now, the two side plates, together with the two beams and the arrow-shaped spacer, are bonded together using the EMA plastic weld to form the actual axle beam. The plastic weld is one of the few solvents which will work with acrylic, which is what this material is. These are easily assembled by stacking one beam, then the arrow spacer, and then the other beam and then you add one side plate to each side. And this then forms the beam itself. There we go, the second beam forming the stack of three. And this is the complete completed unit flooded with uh, plastic weld and a slight dress up with a file will clean that up and then we insert the stub axles into the clevis at the ends and these are held with the kingpins. The kingpins are 0.8 mil wire uh, bent to 90 degrees like that and then cut off with a leg that is about eight mil long. We make two of those. And when we've got those, we then uh, insert whichever stub axles we need into the clevis and then retain them with a kingpin vertically down through the holes, like this I hope, 
and then the leg goes over the top of the axle beam and is then covered with epoxy and that not only holds it in position but reinforces the axle. The supplied acrylic track rod is usually used as a jig to bend up a wire one which is then secured using those little washers and a very small dab of epoxy. This then goes to make up the complete axle which you see here and when it's done it should articulate freely like this and if it doesn't a little bit of lube should help that along. So back to the chassis. Uh, a razor saw is now used to cut the fully hardened and cured uh, chassis and to form uh, a slot for the axle. This needs to be three millimeters. Don't use a disc an abrasive disc for this job as it will heat the job up and disturb the epoxy. So use a razor saw or something similar. After the slot is cut, use a needle file or similar to clean it up until you get a nice, easy uh, but cosy fit for the axle, allowing it to uh, drop in and rock, but not to move fore and aft. There you see the cut slot, and uh, then we also move, remove a lot of material on both sides to allow the articulation of the wheels and also the stub axles, the uh, track rods and steering arms. There's a lot of movement and a lot of material needs to be cut away so you can see exactly why uh, we are so reliant on that reinforcing plate. We also need to drill a one millimeter hole dead center uh, for the pivot pin and when assembled with a piece, a piece of one mil wire this then allows the axle to rock and fulfill its function and at this point everything should rock gently and swing round uh, nice and freely with no problem and here you just see a plain uh, axle beam and two made-up wheels. The motors, the top one, is the one we are using. It's a 3.7 volt, 100 RPM, 6 millimeter gear motor. These cost about £3.50 from eBay, from China, and they're pretty good. They're not the uh, most top-notch motors, but they're pretty good. The bottom one was a European equivalent, costing about £30. Um, now, I uh, use Milliput to mount the motor, meshing the gears by eye, making sure they're lined up. The brake lights, uh, I use these little LEDs, they're T0402 red LEDs, they come pre-wired. They're only 0.4 mil by 0.2 mil, so they're really small. Um, I drill 0.8 mil holes or thereabouts through the light cluster. Uh, I paint that hole to create some insulation, otherwise they'll short out. You can then thread the wires through um, run the wires through to the front end and wire them in parallel 
They then need a very small resistor, uh, a 4.7 kilo ohm resistor, and then this is all controlled by the Deltang RX41 receiver, which you can also buy pre-wired. And after a bit of careful soldering, you can wire it up to the diagram that you'll see later on in this video, and it'll all end up working like this. Uh, when the body is on, the uh, receiver will sit immediately behind the servo in the cab, so it'll stay invisible, especially when you've painted the servo and all the wires black. Note the charging socket just uh, behind the back axle in white there. The on-off switch uh, built into the underside of the fuel tank. And the servo arm uh, doing its stuff through a drag link to the servo arm. Now I wanted to repaint this vehicle as well. I didn't like the colour but I needed to retain the Bedford badges, so I used Copydex as a masking agent. Uh, it works very, very well, and uh, it did resist the Nitromores paint stripper and also the car aerosol I used to respray with. So that went well. The tag at the back of the cab is a new bit of brass I bent up and drilled uh, so I could bolt the back of the cab down. The headlights are also a disappointment on uh, this vehicle, so being just cast. So I drill them out with a 0.8mm drill or thereabouts and then follow that up with uh, a 2mm drill, just drilling down uh, enough to mimic a reflector at the back of a headlight. So you're left with bare shiny metal forming a reflector. And then I drip in uh, a little bit of epoxy to replicate the headlight lens. And it works very well. Mirrors. These are simply 0.4mm nickel silver wire soldered to strips of nickel silver, polished, trimmed, bent, and glued on, and it improves at no end. The load bed. This is just photoshopped, printed, and weathered a bit, and glued in, and it works. Here we have the wiring diagram of this uh, project. I'm showing a different type of charging socket. For this, we're actually using a much, much smaller charging socket that you can buy from Micron Radio Control. And here you can see that it actually works. This has been a very short, abridged video. Uh, if you want to know more detail, do look up uh, many of my other videos just search for Giles Engineer or have a look on RM Web, and you'll find much, much more information. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you've found it of some interest. Good luck.